come back again because of video, and they it seem to slowly develop, you know, their audience. You know, thank God for video. Can I get a glass of water from? Oh sure. Mother? No, I'll get it. Sit. Sure. Absolutely. So it was ten years ago. About two weeks ago, that a buddy of mine from Emerson College came down. There was uh, basically technical, and I'm not a technician. My background technical was writing. In, in so technical in the nuts and bolts uh, of, of the uh, mechanics you know, center. Uh, editing. Um, yeah, at the same time, I think that most kids come out of film school, you know, and you can't, they can't really work as a, even apprentice editors. They don't know how to put trims away the mm -hmm. right way. I mean, my girlfriend is an editor. She's putting a picture for Vestron, and... Uh, you know, they have kids right out of film school, and you'd mm -hmm. think that, you know, they'd know mm -hmm. at least something of it. But you know, basically in film have school, an ashtray, uh, you you know, you throw trims in a paper bag, and you don't mm -hmm. have to worry about putting them back in the right. Mm -hmm. But no, we got nothing on, you know, the realities and of this it. This was in four years. This was in four years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was basically you, you know make you should get your money back. You should sue. Right. You know, like these kids who sue that they can't read when they graduate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to make the same claim. I mean, basically, I mean, we were real fortunate because, it, you know, it took us a year to actually go out, you know, knocking on doors. You know, we knew enough to go to accountants and attorneys and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, we eventually found a, a CPA who had some clients, put up a quarter of a million bucks, and uh, they went out doing real well with the film. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so well, we're terrific. So, and, and, and how'd you rate it? In a limited partnership? A limited partnership, partnership yeah. Uh -huh. And it was also that's in the great. last days of the tax shelters, so mm -hmm. it worked out good. Mm -hmm. new, new line, as I say, picked it up. Yeah, well, I'd love to see that. Yeah, so I have a reel of some of my other films for you. That uh, some things I've done since then that I've been been real pleased with. I've gotten some some good some good reaction. Mm -hmm. Primarily been you know making my living as a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. Well, the fact that you've gotten anything on film is amazing. You know, yeah, it's, you yeah. Know, I have to tell you, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Nobody wants another one. Yeah. And I discovered it. <laughs> and we've been doing. I don't know. I've been doing you know these uh, video interviews with filmmakers now for it's about four years. Uh huh. Uh, and, that's, and you both that's know Mark uh, Hirschfield? Yeah, that Mark, uh, well, I think Ira and Mark started out together. And uh -huh. I did my first film, Summer Wishes, Winter Dreams, with Mark. I uh -huh. bumped into him on the set. We've been friends ever Summer since. Summer Wishes, Winter Dreams. It used to be that was Gil Snow Gates? Movie. Yeah. Uh -huh. right. Gil gave me my break. I did my first interview in college with him. Mm -hmm. We did six films together, and then he went out to L.A. I went to his kid's bar mitzvah. And uh -huh. He was father to me. Right, right. Yeah. nice guy. Oh, yeah, extremely. I met him in uh, Yugoslavia. Um, when I was uh, taking uh, Save the Tiger around, as a matter of fact. And I introdu introduced us, and uh, I asked Mark to shoot uh, a low budget feature that I'm doing in May. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be his. He's he just got his first DP gig, and this will be his second. So he's uh, you know finally going to get to. Oh, that's true. And, what, and what's he doing? This is the first one that he's going to do. The first one he's doing he's doing right now for Amos Kolak. It starts uh, in February, mm -hmm. and then our picture starts in uh, our markets. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> More opportunities. Okay. <coughs> John, your new picture for Keeps uh, is a very sweet, charming film. Uh, sorry, Molly Ringwald and Randall uh, Batinkoff is a Batinkoff. Batinkoff, a new young actor, is very good in the film. What uh, what attracted you uh, to the material in the first place? Um, the, uh, the opportunity to, uh, to do a love story. Um, I always liked Molly. And, um, the story itself seemed to, uh, to be about something, and, uh, that's unusual. And, um, I had to do something because there was uh, going to be a cutoff period when uh, people stopped making movies in anticipation of the, uh, DGA strike that never happened. So, uh, those were all the factors. Mm -hmm. Now, in... In working with, with Molly and Randall, Molly, of course, is, is a very experienced uh, young actress. Randall is a relative newcomer. Um, how did you kind of, you know, get them together to, you know, kind of build their relationship, you know, say prior to, to, to filming? Well, they, um, they went out a few times, and, and, and Randall is uh, a very nice young man, and he, uh, he did his homework, and uh, they got along pretty well. He was a new boy in the block and uh, took a certain amount of heat because of that. But he uh, performed very well under uh, pressure. And you filmed the picture in Chicago? Hmm. No, I haven't heard that one. No? No. Uh, the story was uh, supposedly taking place in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We shot it in Los Angeles. And uh, we did the winter scenes up in uh, Winnipeg.
Ah. To make it look like uh, Kenosha in the snow. And the closest we got to Kenosha was uh, in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, where we shot the university. Oh, I see. So we never got to Kenosha. Now, in, uh, I'm just curious, when you, when you start a picture, uh, and it's, it's the first day of shooting and everyone's gathered, do you, are you the kind of director that you know, maybe makes a little speech to uh, the cast and crew, uh, or do you just kind of get right, get right into it? Yeah, I think, yeah, we, we, as far as the cast is concerned, we've all heard the speeches, and uh, the crew is often uh, people I've worked with in the past, so um, there's not a lot of ceremony. So let's get to work. So I guess you have a, a core group of uh, technical people that follow you from, from film to film. Yes. Uh, in the case of uh, Jimmy Crabe, who uh, is a cameraman in, in uh, Los Angeles, and we've done uh, a lot of movies together, starting with uh, Save the Tiger. And um, his, uh, his crew is often the, the same guys. And, um, and of course, uh, Bill Connie that I've been fortunate to have seven or eight pictures with. So, uh, and then prior to that, I made a lot of pictures with uh, Ralph Boda uh, here in New York, and the same crew on, on everything from... Uh, uh, I guess what we learned in school today to uh, through Joe and Cry Uncle it was all the same folks. In terms of your involvement with, with video, uh, you were really one of the first American directors to cut on, on video. Uh, what were some of the advantages in, uh, to, to that process for you? Well, I used the video uh, editing process uh, in conjunction with the, with the film, the 35 millimeter film. In other words, I cut it in order that the 35 millimeter film would be cut to conform with what I did on the video. So I was never concerned with the video ever being uh, shown. So I would make copies and it would start falling apart, but that wasn't the concern. <clears throat> so the process I use, a very simple process of transferring the uh, dailies onto uh, VHS. Uh, just and, and breaking them down into a particular order that I'll know that I want the cassettes to uh, be in. In other words, I want one cassette <clears throat> with a particular, say, scene one with all the with the master shot, and then in cassette two, I'll have the uh, close up of the person looking to the right, and then in the other cassette, I'll have the close up of the person looking to the left. So I pop in the uh, the masters, find the one, I transfer that onto uh, the uh, the cassette that I'm building. Um, pop in the uh, the close up, get that done, and then pop in, and it's and it's real fast. And I'm not uh, looking for trims, and I'm not uh, pasting the stuff together. And uh, you just press uh, a button to get a preview of what it's going to be like. And if you don't like it, you adjust it until you like it, and then you hit it, and you go on to the next one. That is much faster. You don't have to keep track of uh, the stuff. The whole movie fits into a couple of bookcases, whereas you'd need uh, rooms and rooms for the 35 millimeter film, so it's uh, much faster and I think you, you're able to do a better job because you're not spending 90% of the time physically cutting the film and scotch taping it together and mounting it again and having the machine eat it and the rest of it. In terms of the sound editing, you worked on this film with a terrific sound editor, Dan Sable. <coughs> uh, at what point then does he enter into it? Well, Dan, now we first worked together on Neighbors uh, and since then Dan has uh, computerized his uh, sound effects and has a terrific system that I, I don't know how it works, but it works real well. And he's able to uh, press buttons and get uh, stuff on a, uh, on a track, and it's uh, real quick. So when I'm, when I'm doing it, when I'm doing it I, I don't get into uh, sound effects on the uh, video. I'm just cutting a uh, picture primarily in the, uh, in the dialogue. And I'll cut a, uh, one scene and send it into the uh, cutting room, and they'll, uh, they'll conform the uh, work print uh, to the tape. And then they'll make a tape of that and send me that. I'll look at it and I'll either make adjustments or I'll start building my uh, my uh, work picture. How does that affect then your your staff, for example? Well, they say they uh, they like it because there's uh, well maybe they didn't like it because I was going to say there's very little overtime because there's the, the time spent in in cataloging the trims and uh, rebuilding the reels and chem reels and so forth you don't have because. When the cut is made, that's it, usually. And there's sometimes uh, adjustments, but not, not often. And then once it, the picture is all together, then I'll start refining a little bit more on the, uh, on the film itself. But by then, it's, 
it's 90% done. So uh, I would think that uh, life in the cutting room for the assistants and so forth is a little simpler. Now you've, you're in the, edit the editor's union. Uh, you cut for keeps yourself. Uh, you've been pre president of the cameraman's union. Uh, as a director, did, did you face any resistance from the unions? Uh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, the reason I cut uh, for keeps uh, here in New York was that I uh, applied for membership in the uh, local in uh, Los Angeles and was uh, turned down. Reason being that in their contract it says um, uh, one of the clauses is that uh, our, none of our members will uh, perform more than uh, one function on the film, meaning that if you're the editor, you can't also be the assistant. And if you're the assistant, you can't also be the apprentice, or vice versa. Um, and I ran into the same problem with the camera local uh, here in New York. And they had a, a similar provision. And because uh, I wanted to operate uh, the camera in addition to directing the movie. And they made the same objection, but eventually was uh, uh, voted down. Because there again, if you're the operator, you can't be the assistant. And if you're the film loader, you can't be the DP. And, and so on, which is fine. In other words, they can make rules that govern their particular uh, uh, category, but they can't make, in other words, it would mean that if I wrote the picture, I couldn't photograph it. And uh, that's not the intention. So anyway, I got nowhere with this argument in Los Angeles, and uh, they refused me uh, membership. So I was already in the local uh, here, so we, sh we, we cut it here. Now, does your, you know, you're, you're obviously very, very... And the reason, I think, to answer your question mm -hmm. uh, more fully, the reason, I think, is that they're afraid that all the directors will start uh, cutting their own pictures. And I don't think that's a concern that's, that has any reality in it. Yeah, I think most directors <coughs> welcome an editor to come in they with... They don't want to bother. I mean, they don't know how. It's not that, that it's so, so difficult, but I don't think uh, most directors... Um, get into that and they're used to working with a uh, with an editor and they often have an editor that they they enjoy working with and uh, they have a good relationship going and I always did it myself because I started that way and I also figured that nobody would stay up as late as I will covering all my blunders and the cutting process is the last chance to uh, to save the movie so I've always done it myself. And do you think that was my next question was you know this kind of you know the, the different hats that you wear uh, would seem to you know come from your beginnings making low budget features. Uh huh. Yeah, when I first um, uh, started uh, uh, doing doing this, I was doing industrial films for uh, an agency that uh, an advertising agency that uh, did industrial shows and so forth. So I'd make these uh, movies that ran anywhere from a few minutes to an hour for IBM or Clairol or Shell Oil to get their salesmen excited about whatever it was that they were um, trying to get them excited about. So I was hired to, uh, to direct these things and I hired myself as uh, the cameraman and, and as the uh, editor and did the thing myself and it was uh, a great learning process and a lot of fun to do. Um, there was very little supervision, and you could uh, use whatever music you wanted, and uh, so that's uh, that's how I uh, how I started, and I figured I was a more attractive commodity to uh, to the buyer if uh, for the same eight bucks you got three jobs instead of one. In your early early days of your career uh, in features, you worked uh, for Ira Preminger on Hurry Sundown. Is it true that he was uh, as volatile on the set as perhaps some of the stories go? Yes, yes, he was volatile, um, but also he could be very kind, and uh, he was very generous to me, and uh, gave me a lot of opportunities, and uh, uh, he only yelled at me once. Uh, we were down in uh, Baton Rouge, and we were shooting in a courthouse, and um, Burgess Meredith was uh, the judge, and the scene was about to be uh, uh, shot, and uh, quiet had been uh, called, and I was whispering to uh, a friend in the sidelines, and suddenly Otto spotted me. He said, Mr. Allison, why is it that you write me letters that you want to work in my movies, then you come down and you talk? So I got nailed uh, that afternoon. Uh, but that was rather mild uh, from what he uh, 
I, I saw him destroy a, a prop man who had uh, schlepped um, um, two armfuls full of pots and pans across the muddy uh, plantation field down in Louisiana to see which one um, Otto wanted, right? And he just threw them on the ground and yelled at this guy. It was terrible, terrible. So, um, and he would do this uh, uh, to actors. I remember there was a, some actor came in to a screen test, did the scene, and um, when it was over, uh, Otto said, you called yourself an actor? That was a terrible... No. This guy flipped out, grabbed Otto, got him down on the floor, and was about to punch him, and Otto looks up at him and says, what's the matter? You can't take a job? <laughs> <laughs> he was quite a character. I learned a, a great deal uh, from him. He... Uh, worked uh, with the camera very well. His work with the actors, um, I didn't see a lot of, uh, uh, of evidence of, of the time he took. I remember one, one scene that was late at night out in the, in the swamps and John Law was going to drive up uh, in an old truck with uh, uh, Faye Dunaway. It was Faye Dunaway's first movie. And, um, and stop at this cabin in the woods and um, just before they shot it, uh, John looks at, at Preminger and says, Now, uh, refresh my memory, Otto. Uh, where is it that I've just uh, come from in this scene? And uh, Preminger says, Where you come from is not your concern. You come up and you stop in the line. That's what you do. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's one way of doing it. Uh, I, that, uh, that technique I haven't uh, embraced. But I learned a great deal from him. He was uh, very nice to me. And You'd also uh, worked for Arthur Penn on uh, Mickey One uh, for a time. Right. Arthur works uh, much closer w with, the, uh, with the actors. Uh, and from my uh, observation, didn't uh, work as closely uh, with the camera as uh, Preminger. And I, I had just worked for Preminger before him, so I, I could contrast the two. But Arthur was much more involved with uh, getting the best possible performance out of the actor, which he does very well. Your first feature as a director uh, was a visual turn on to love in the late 60s, uh, what was termed a sexploitation film. At that time, what would, what would that, uh, how would you define that? Well, that was before the, the, uh, the term porno and hardcore and so forth, and I think uh, uh, a lady's breast was about uh, as exciting as it got, it was a world without pubic hair, and um, the language wasn't particularly exciting. And the stories were usually pretty boring, and um, mine was really boring. It was a terrible picture. How was your your experience directing your first uh, low budget picture? Well, that was it. Uh, Turn on to love. We did it in seven days for fifteen grand on five year out of date Triax, thirty five, at a sixteen print was made of to cut. I didn't have anything to do with the cutting. Um, and it was, uh, it was, you know, pretty bad. But it, it did uh, okay, made some money for um, the, uh, the producer, and um, it got me the opportunity to, uh, to do the next one, and then the next one, and the fourth one was Joe, and that made it a little easier. And Joe is, a, a, again, a, you know, a, truly a sleeper. Um, how do you account for that? And was it the timing on, on that? The timing couldn't have been better. Um, Norman Wexler, who was an old friend of mine from the uh, advertising business and, and was a playwright, had uh, uh, thought of this uh, idea, being inspired by uh, Agnew and his uh, rantings about the, the silent majority, and um, an article by Gay Gail Sheehy in New York Magazine on um, title Speed is of the Essence about a... Uh, drug dealer and a socialite girl from Connecticut and so forth. So he had this notion that these two things would uh, intermingle and uh, told me the, uh, the idea and gave me a five-page outline, uh, which I thought was terrific. And I tried to sell it to Canon at the time, and, uh, and they weren't uh, interested. And a few months uh, later, while I was finishing up another picture, guess what we learned in school today? They came and said, hey, you have to make something for us. Uh, because uh, this script that we raise money on is no good, but if we don't make something, we have to give the money back, and we don't want to do that. So I said that, that outline I showed you uh, would make a, a, a good movie. I think you, you ought to consider that. So they said, okay, uh, out of desperation, and we made the deal that afternoon, and four weeks uh, later we were uh, shooting the movie, and during those four weeks uh, Norman wrote the script. So it all happened very quickly out of desperation and not out of any great uh, knowing that it was going to be a, uh, 
a successful movie. So that was made in January of 70. And then in May of 70, a bunch of construction workers down in Wall Street uh, uh, did battle with some um, Vietnam War protesters, and the term hard hat was, uh, was coined to embody this mentality and, and so on. And then that July, Joe came out, and here was this guy that we've been reading about spouting all this stuff that was right below the surface in the society at the time. So it um, struck a lot of, uh, uh, of responsive chords, and it was a great example of good timing. You also, in that film, introduced film goers to two terrific actors, uh, Peter Boyle and, and Susan Sarandon. How did they come to be cast? Uh, um, we did about a two or, two or three week intensive casting uh, period. Susan came in and, uh, and uh, knocked me out. She had a great set of, uh, of blinkers, and she was uh, very good, and she uh, was right on the money. And uh, Peter Boyle came in, and um, I'd given uh, the, uh, the candidates for the part of Joe this uh, scene where we first uh, meet him, where he's uh, uh, damning the hippies and the music and the blacks, and he's just uh, carrying on. And as, as written, uh, there was a particular speech that, that went... Um, you, sh you show me a welfare worker who's not a nigger lover, and I'll massage your asshole. That was the line. And when Peter came to, uh, to read the line, he said, and I'll massage your asshole, and I ain't queer. He improvised that himself. And I knew right then that this was the guy, because what a, what a perfect addition to dialogue, because a guy in Joe's situation would certainly say that, because he would want to make sure that nobody would get the wrong idea. Um, so I was sold on, on him, but Cannon felt that he was uh, too young and, and didn't look old enough for somebody who'd been in World War uh, II. So um, we went with another actor who uh, ended up slugging a sales lady at uh, Bloomingdale's and peeing on the escalator. So um, we, we decided to go with uh, Peter Boyle, which I'm very pleased that we did. Interestingly, uh, after the, the great commercial success of Joe, uh, you really continued to work in low-budget independent features. Uh, I assume that the Hollywood came calling after Joe. Well, uh, as a result of, uh, of uh, Joe, I was able to do uh, Save the Tiger. Jack Lemmon had, uh, had seen the movie and liked uh, my work and, and so forth. Um, I did a couple of pictures after Joe before Save the Tiger, uh, Cry Uncle and, um, and uh, The Stoolie with uh, Jackie Mason. Where does uh, OK Bill fit in? Uh, uh, OK Bill, uh, a.k.a. Sweet Dreams, that was its first name, um, was the uh, second picture I did. And, um, and then after Joe came out, it didn't, it didn't, nothing happened after I did it. <laughs> Nobody fainted. So after Joe came out, they figured they'll read, they, I, I put in a more political soundtrack. And, um, and because Joe worked, they called it OK Bill. And uh, it had a very limited release. Mm -hmm. Save the Tiger uh, is, a, is a fine, fine film. It won uh, Jack Lemmon the Academy Award. Um, in working with with Mr. Lemmon, uh, you you seem to have shorn him of of some of those mannerisms that that he has uh, exhibited in some of his comedies. Uh, how did he, you know, respond to that to to your direction? Well, when I was auditioning. Uh, for the job, and went out to uh, to meet uh, Jack Lemmon. Um, I uh, I said to him, that I've I've always been a big fan of yours, and I've always loved your movies. But if I do this, if I if you end up choosing me to direct it, uh, I don't want to see you in it. He said, What? I said, Well, I know the eyebrows and, the, and all that stuff that you do. I'm going to try to get you not to do it uh, because it always reminds me of you and gets in the way of the character. And he said, that's, that's great, Slick. He said, you keep your eyes open. So we, uh, we started doing it. I got the job, and, um, and there'd be, uh, I'd see an eyebrow or something, and I'd say cut, and I'd come over, and before I'd even open my mouth, he would say, you don't want the eyebrow, right? And I said, yeah, let's try it without the eyebrow. I said, okay. <laughs> and he was delightful. He was a, a, I was very fortunate in, in having uh, an actor of his magnitude uh, on my first picture. Uh, in Hollywood, because he made it very easy for me. In many of the the pictures uh, in which you've used, you've worked with, you know, kind of the major movie stars. 
uh, perhaps you've had a less happy experience than when you've worked with some of the lesser known people, when you've worked with a Peter Boyle or a Sylvester Stallone or Ralph Macchio, as opposed to working uh, with, say, Burt Reynolds and WW and the Dixie Dance Kings uh, or Belushi and Neighbors. Do you have a, you know, do you lean more towards the relative newcomer uh, as opposed to, to the major movie star? Well, it, you know, it depends on the uh, on the story. It depends on the circumstance. Certainly, with the uh, new face, it's it's sometimes more of a trip for an audience to to see this this new face and not have all the preconceived notions uh, and so forth. They're also much uh, less expensive, and um, and they don't have the uh, mannerisms. They don't have the uh, ego. They don't have all the excess uh, baggage that uh, a lot of stars uh, carry around with them, and. Um, they're, uh, they're, the, the big star can be a, a big headache. And Rocky, uh, of course, a huge hit, uh, spawned a, a whole series of Rocky films, really got Sylvester Stallone's career off the ground. Uh, what was he like at that time and early in his great. career? He was a starving actor, which is the best kind. Very appreciative, and he was a, an absolute uh, pleasure to work with. Couldn't have been a nicer time, and he wrote it, so he knew everybody's lines, and we and there was no pride of authorship, so we were constantly uh, redoing the uh, uh, the story in different scenes and changing things, and um, he was uh, tireless and never uh, complained about rehearsing or working, so it couldn't have been nicer. When did you know that you had a, a smash hit on your hands with Rocky? Uh, I guess when when the lines around the block. Uh, persisted weekend after weekend because I was I, I just couldn't believe it I you know I, I didn't figure that that was that kind of a movie was in the cards uh, so I was very pleased I was skeptical for a long time though. how did you uh, the, the final the final scene of that picture is, is just a classic classic moment in, in American motion pictures how did that how did you approach that scene I understand there was a little, little bit of reshooting involved after a preview um, well, no, not after a preview. The, the scene, as originally written, after the uh, fight, the extras carry uh, um, uh, Apollo uh, out of the ring, and, and, uh, and the, the crowd carries uh, Rocky out on their shoulders, and as he's uh, going down the aisle, he looks down and sees uh, Adrian reach over, or pulls her up, and, uh, and the two of them go out on the shoulders of the crowd. You know, the happiest night of their lives, I think the script was the final sentence. So that's what uh, we were planning on uh, shooting and uh, we had gotten to the point where um, the crowd carries out uh, Apollo Creed. Now the next uh, setup was they're going to carry out uh, Rocky. So the assistant director came up to me and said we don't have enough extras uh, to carry out uh, Rocky. Well obviously the same extras that carried out uh, Apollo are going to carry out uh, Rocky. That's uh, was how I was figuring on doing it. Well, Sylvester heard that, and it got him thinking. He said, wait a second, maybe maybe uh, they don't carry out Rocky. Maybe because he lost the fight, nobody's uh, interested in him, and maybe he just walks, gets out of the ring and walks down the aisle by himself, sees Spider Rico from the first picture, and Spider says, you did good, Rocky. Says, Thanks, Spider. And there's um, Adrian, and they look at each other, and they hold hands, and they uh, walk away. So that sounded... Uh, very poetic and reasonable and so forth. So I said, great, okay, let's do that. And that's what we did do. And if you remember, the poster had uh, the boy and the girl, Rocky and Adrian, walking away from us, uh, walking away from the camera holding hands. And that was going to be the last shot of the movie. So now I'm, uh, I'm putting it uh, together. And I would worked with uh, uh, Bill Conti uh, before we started shooting. Um, and showed him uh, my uh, Super 8 movies of uh, the uh, rehearsals, and particularly the, uh, the boxing rehearsals, which had gone on for a long time. And I'd, uh, I'd project those and, and, and reduce the speed so it would be a little slow, and I'd play uh, some Beethoven, and I'd say, this is, this is what I want this thing to uh, evoke. Cause I think boxing is pretty dumb, and, uh, and I've never been a boxing fan. So I wanted to make it look as terrific and get you know great music behind it. So it it became something more than just two guys slugging each other. So uh, he knew the kind of uh, of sound that I was uh, hoping for. So 
at a certain point towards the uh, the end of the editing, he brought me uh, the music for the uh, for the final scene for the last cue. I listened to this music. I'm knocked out. I said, "This is great," but I don't have any footage that will go with this. I got these two people walking away f away from the camera, uh, and whatever that is, it sure isn't what this sounds like. You know, this this sounds like a Clairol commercial where the two people are running to each other in the hill and and so forth, right? I mean, it, it had that kind of uh, emotion uh, and schmaltz going in the uh, music. So I said, what this, what this evokes is uh, Rocky's in the ring and he's yelling for Adrian and Adrian's down and then he's Rocky, Rocky, and they, and they come together and he says, I love you and we're out. And that music is, is behind all that. So I said, well, I don't know. I mean, what's wrong with the way it is? So... Uh, so I, I, I transferred the music and, and, and cut uh, some film. I didn't have the footage that I needed, but I had, had crowd shots or pictures of them. And I said, now you've got to imagine that uh, when, you're, when you see this thing now, you're, you're going to see these other shots, but at least you'll see shots and music and you'll see the thing. And so I played it with the music. They said, oh, oh okay. And um, so we went back for half a day and 20 extras to walk in front of the lens to make, make like a crowd. And we... Uh, shot the um, the last um, minute or two minutes of the uh, movie when they're coming uh, together and it sure made all the difference in the world. I remember seeing the picture for the first time and I mean, the, everyone in the audience, we all just went nuts. I mean, that happened all over the world. It really, uh, really worked terrifically. Now, yeah, well, that was uh, uh, Bill, Bill Conti's music, which um, his score wasn't even nominated for that movie, which I think was a great omission. Um, but he made a, made a beautiful contribution to that picture. Of course, he won the, let's not forget, John Avelson's Direction, which won the Academy Award that year. Um, he must have been inundated, inundated with offers uh, after, after winning the award. I mean, did you, how did you try to maintain your, uh, you know, from, keep from floating off the ground? Well, it certainly was a rush, and um, a lot of stuff did uh, come my way, and uh, I made a lot of... Uh, of uh, poor choices and um, and reeled with the uh, impact of uh, uh, success through a number of turkey movies and uh, then got lucky again with uh, Karate Kid. Which of course has you know some parallels to to Rocky uh, not the least of which is you know kind of like new new fresh actors uh, you know Ralph Macchio is, and Pat Morito just such a wonderful Wonderful chemistry uh, in in both pictures. Uh, in terms of again, you know, developing their relationship, was there anything, you know, you kind of did to to help that along? Well, Robert Kamen wrote a real good uh, script, and he wrote the relationship uh, very well. And uh, uh, Ralph and and Ralph Macchio and Pat Morita uh, hit it off on a personal uh, level too. They had a lot of respect and affection uh, for each other. We spent a lot of time rehearsing. Uh, I'd videotape uh, uh, the rehearsals and we worked in a very informal and, and friendly uh, atmosphere and um, that, that friendly atmosphere makes a big difference. If, if everybody's liking each other and having a nice time, the work that uh, comes out the other end is always better because the energy is going to that rather than, oh, is, is Charlie angry today, and, you know, and who's, f who's freaked out in the last 20 minutes? Then, then all the energy is worrying about that rather than trying to uh, uh, make the movie and use the, um, the, the very expensive uh, few hours that you're uh, given each day to shoot to get on the film the best you can. Uh, and, that, and that's tough to do. And it takes a lot of concentration, a lot of uh, cooperation, and and so forth, um, because the the time is is so uh, precious, and there's so little of it. So you got to really be together, or otherwise, it doesn't work as well. How did you approach uh, you know some of the some of the choreographed martial arts uh, sequences in, in, in the Karate Kid films? From a fair distance, so I wouldn't get hit. <laughs> Uh, I was very lucky and, and got uh, Pat Johnson, who is a martial art artist and master karate uh, person. Again, I know as much about karate as I do about boxing. And Robert Kamen, who wrote the story, is a black belt, and he knows all about uh, that. So um, I, uh, I listened, and, and uh, I said, oh, that, that's a nice uh, um, step or 
sock or whatever it is, but could you do this and still be true to it and, could, and make, make a nicer picture if you did that? And they said, oh, yeah, sure. So we, uh, we all worked uh, closely with, uh, with one another, and, um, and we rehearsed uh, for weeks and weeks. Um, every blow, which was a, a technique I learned in, uh, in uh, Rocky, that you, you, can't, you can't improvise something like that. You have to uh, get it down. And I eventually had uh, uh, Sylvester uh, write, you know, Right, and it ended up about 16 pages of lefts and rights and ducks and all this stuff. And over the uh, weeks prior to the shooting, they, they learned it like a ballet. And the same with the uh, karate. So when we came to shoot it, it would look as, as good as it could, you know, given the time that we had, and uh, nobody would get hurt. And I'd also be able to figure out the best angles to uh, shoot the various uh, kicks and blows uh, and punches from, in order to make them uh, look uh, convincing. The, the Karate Kid uh, sequel is really one of the one of those few sequels that you know that kind of stand you know on its own. I mean, it's it's a kind of a natural, very natural continuation of characters that you want to spend more time with. Uh, you, I assume, developed the script uh, with with Bob Kamen. Uh, Karate Kid Part Two. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we uh, we spent uh, a lot of time uh, working on it. We're very. Uh, uh, Pleased with uh, how it came out, and had a great time in Hawaii shooting. Just going back to uh, some of the pictures, uh, the, the formula, um, a very complex, uh, oh, complex weaving in a plot like kind. Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I remember I read the uh, galleys before the book came out, and I couldn't understand. I kept reading it and going back and calling up Steve Shagan and saying. Wait a second, if they did that, then that would mean that the German... But why would they do that? He said, I don't know. So I, I, I found it a very convoluted uh, uh, plot and, um, and, um, and learned a very expensive lesson. Because uh, I, I was betting that um, the movie wouldn't be made. And I, uh, they optioned my time to, uh, to get the script and, uh, and a cast together. And I, I said, okay, sure, I'll give you the, the next 60 days. Um, and because uh, I thought that within those 60 days, somebody would surely realize that this thing wasn't that, was too, too complex. And, and they, would, uh, they would turn it down, they would stop, and I'd walk away with uh, a fistful of dollars and uh, not have to make a movie. I got caught. They made the movie. You know, interestingly, uh, Brando is always fascinating to watch, and I'm just curious. I mean, I mean, that was, I remember at the time it was quite a coup. I mean, everyone was offering Brando millions of dollars for everything under the sun. Um, COD. <laughs> he got paid every day in cash. Is that so? That's yeah. true. Mm -hmm. How was? It, can you describe your you know, your first meeting meeting with Brando? Uh, we went up. Uh, up uh, on uh, Mulholland Drive to see him one afternoon, and uh, he was very cordial, and uh, um, we started talking about the uh, story, and he started uh, telling us uh, how he imagined uh, this uh, character, uh, uh, who was sort of patterned after a um, arm and hammer type of um, oil magnate. And he saw this guy living out in the desert as uh, like a desert rat, with big dish antennas, and but being sort of a recluse and a hermit and so forth, and walking around in rags and so on. And he described this guy very eloquently. And and um, Steve Shagan, who was the writer producer, was uh, sitting next to me, and I could sense this poor guy was dying. That you know, here Brando was creating this totally different character. So. Uh, so he was saying, oh, well, well, sure, I guess he could live in the desert, yeah. Uh, and I'm, this is making no sense to me at all. And uh, so Marlon finished, and I said, I don't know. I, I, I see this guy as one of those guys with the, the coat and the vest on the cover of uh, Time magazine. I mean, he's the, uh, he's the establishment. Why make him some kind of screwball? Uh, so there was a long pause, and Brandon said, okay, I was just testing you. <laughs> <laughs> so he he was uh, once he uh, signed on he was uh, he was a pleasure a lot of fun and and very funny very funny guy 
bits like, uh, for example, the scene where uh, Brando and Scott are, are in Brando's office and Brando offers the milk duds. Right, that was Marlon's uh, suggestion. That was originally written as uh, have a cigar. And he said, well, why didn't they uh, offer him some milk duds? So I said, get some milk duds. And uh, he was constantly coming up with that. How about the bit where he's uh, hiding, where he's obscured by the Again, that was uh, his suggestion. Uh, unfortunately, some of his best stuff, um, uh, which was in the first scene where we meet him at, in, in, the, in the Grand uh, Palatial Estate, and he's having uh, breakfast in his uh, French butler, there was, uh, that scene went on for uh, a couple of minutes more where uh, he was doing outrageous stuff that was just hilarious. But um, uh, David Beagleman, who was the uh, convicted felon that was running MGM at the time, uh, didn't think it was funny. Neighbors must have been an incredibly difficult exchange. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the thing I, I remember, I think, the best about Formula besides Brando is, is that. that and then the, the young Except lieutenant. Dry off a little there. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's okay. I got and it. A little forehead, too. And a um, uh, bit shiny. And. Um, how's that? Can you see you sitting down? Oh, fine. fine. Uh, and. Um, you know, to, to set all that uh, up a bit more, but I got shot down, and that's what we never, uh, we never shot that. Um, so I, I, my, I, I did my uh, version, which was about a good 20, 30 minutes shorter than the thing that got released. Really? Um, well, that's a flip, isn't it? For yeah, me? well, I just figured there was just too much uh, to follow.